So today it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephen Monismith. Uh, Stephen is the Obayashi Professor in the School of Engineering and Director of the Environmental Fluid Mechanics Laboratory at Stanford. His research focuses on environmental and geophysical fluid dynamics applied to rivers, lakes, estuaries, and the oceans, including mixing processes and their ecological impacts. And today he will talk about flows through kelp forest, seagrass beds, and coral reefs. So over to you, Stephen. Good. Well, thank you, Adrian, and thanks for um, inviting me to participate in this seminar. And uh, I've passed the link on. Hopefully our students in our lab will not mind getting up for the rest of the year at, at eight o'clock in the morning. It's tough for students to, uh, to hear these seminars. So today I want to talk about flow through living roughness. And I'm showing here actually an example of living roughness. These are corals uh, in a lagoon on uh, the island of Ofu in American Samoa. Uh, some of the bigger ones, like this one here on the left, ones, the biggest ones of this in this lagoon are like three or 400 years old. And it's a single living organism. There's one nearby, the next island over Tau, that's around 2,000 years old. The single same organism. So I'm going to talk about, uh, well, three and a half stories. Actually, I edited it a little bit. Um, about talking about things on Ofu and then a little bit of Morea. Um, Palau and Baja, and I have a large number of excellent collaborators and friends. Um, as I say, this is the kind of work that it takes a village to accomplish. Um, it's not the single person sitting at their, at their de desk with pen and pencil, um, pumping out the JFM papers. Um, so this is a very different kind of work, I think, than the usual uh, things we might see here at Damped um, in the seminar series. So, I'm going to show you measurements made in the near shore of coastal systems and ask just the question is why do fluid mechanics in this realm? And the reason is it's the place where the ecosystems are in a lot of ways of most interest. There are resident fish populations. And one practical matter for the things that we do is it's about the limit of what you can, where you can work doing, doing uh, research using scuba diving. So a lot of what I'm going to show you is actually done, instruments deployed, recovered on scuba, but also it's, um, these are some of the most interesting places on earth. And at these places, um, we doing fluid mechanics are asked by our colleagues, ecologists, biogeochemists, to tell them about, tell us, tell them about the flow. And the things that are important in the flow is the fact that the currents drive mass transfer between water column and the things stuck to the bottom, corals, kelp, seagrasses. For example, for corals and it's things like nutrient uptake. There's mass transfer limitation that could be important to coral bleaching. There's also some really complicated and yet to be explored in detail fluid mechanics of particles being captured by the corals. Since the corals, which are animals, are essentially hunter gatherers and agriculturalists, they grow their own symbionts and they capture um, various particles from the water column. Seagrasses and kelp, it's nutrient uptake also, but also things related to carbon fluxes to change pH. For example, there have been proposals to use seagrasses and kelp as means of uh, uh, providing carbon sinks to help with, um, with climate change. Now that's a, so this is kind of the overall issue. The, the fact is currents control how long the water is in contact with these, with these biota. That's the thing they generally, our colleagues generally know residence time. So whatever changes in concentration these entities can produce um, is associated with the flows through them. The other thing place that the flows tend to come up is currents move larval organisms around. And so it determines the extent to which different places in the ocean are connected or not to each other. This is what's called connectivity. So these are kind of the questions that motivate what we do. So I've given you now the first, maybe two paragraphs of any NSF proposal we write. But a lot of what I'm gonna show you goes back to um, work, the, the fundamental thing we teach in fluid mechanics about open channel flow with pressure gradients produced by a sloping free surface here labeled with zeta for the free surface, balancing bottom drag. And um, for those of you that are interested in this topic, the, the history of this is pretty amazing. I, I learned it last quarter. And the only reason I could see that Manning's name is associated 
um, with the equation we generally use for open channel flow is that he wrote it in English, whereas his predecessors wrote it in French and German, but got the same result. But not being in English, I guess, in the late 19th century, it didn't count. So the key thing here in this momentum balance is the drag coefficient. And here we've expressed it in terms of the depth average flow. And this drag coefficient depends on the roughness of the bottom. The rougher it is, the bigger the drag coefficient, more friction. Um, Nicarazzi, before World War II, basically determined this by sticking sand grains inside a pipe. But the question is, what are the sand grains sizes of these kind of things? So here we got a selection of, of coral reefs, a seagrass bed, and the kelp forest at Hopkins. So how do we represent this drag due to these kind of objects that are in the flow, in the flow and on the bottom? So before I proceed, I just want to show you sort of kind of the ex expensive and sophisticated moorings we'll use in these shallow flows, like an acoustic Doppler profiler. It measures profiles of, of velocity uh, using a Doppler shift. And here we've seen it stuck on the bottom with dive weights. Um, we also use acoustic Doppler velocimeters. Here, the ubiquitous cinder block used to also help to hold this instrument in place. This measures three velocity components at a point. We also have pressure loggers here, yet again seen stuck to the bottom with um, cinder blocks. I should point out this pressure logger here now sells for about $20,000 and can measure pressure to an accuracy of about a tenth of a millimeter of water. So it's quite good. So the first thing I want to show you then is drag on a coral reef. And this is work that Justin Rogers and, the, and I and others published in the Journal of Physical Oceanography in 2018 but it makes a nice story. So here's the, the lagoon um, on Ofu. And in 2017, we instrumented one of the pools of this lagoon quite extensively. So each one of the green squares is a two megahertz acoustic Doppler profiler, so really well suited for measuring flows in shallow water. Each of the um, yellow circles is a pressure sensor and the red circles are the high resolution pressure sensors I showed you. We also had some other instruments around. Um, I spoke on, in December at Cambridge about measurements along this line here, D. Today, I'll focus on the flow in the lagoon, which was the source, primary source of, of interest in this project, which was to take the drag in the lagoon and try to connect what we measure to the fine scale bathymetry. And it's roughly equivalent to the, the task of saying, What's the sand grain roughness if you see this kind of coral? So we measure the drag using center differences. So we measure the pressure between two, two points and about halfway between them to the best we can arrange it. Um, we measure the velocity. So it's a classic numerical approach. Here's for the 2017 study, the general results tide. There's about a half meter tide. Wind, not very important. Waves, um, you see these sort of, this is a spectrum with the period and the intensity shows the strength of the, of the waves at that frequency evolving in time. So you see essentially a sequence of storms arrive or wave groups arrive associated with storms somewhere else with some of the biggest events associated when multiple ones of these wave events show up. And this shows up in the significant wave height, or in this case, the RMS wave height here out on the fore reef and in the lagoon where we find typically, as in many systems, that the wave height in the lagoon is controlled primarily by the water depth on the reef. Flow in the lagoon, driven by the tides. It's not really tidal, it's wave-driven flow modulated by the tides. So you see when the tide is big, when the, at high tide, you get a strong flow, low tide, almost nothing. So we take these measurements of these um, acoustic Doppler profilers, we can integrate them over depth, we get the flow at a series of points along the lagoon, it's not quite constant. There's a lot of, uh, it's reasonably difficult uh, to measure the true distribution of flow through any coral reef because it's so spatially variable, but this is reasonably constant. And we can take the drag coefficient measured from the momentum balance we also, Justin also did log fitting of the velocity profiles at some of the stations. 
So you see the log profile values are broadly consistent with the drag coefficients value from the momentum balance. So we have kind of the observations. And in this project, one of the goals was to take drone images. These were acquired by Ved Cheriath, now at the University of Miami, um, then a PhD student at Stanford, and produce topography at order uh, resolution of, of an order of about a centimeter. Um, he initially, we initially talked about a millimeter, but that would have involved um, something like 10 petabytes of data for our domain of interest. And I realized that 10 petabytes of data is a couple hundred thousand dollars of disk. We said, let's go where lower resolution. So we take this topography measured from the images and put it into Oliver Fringer's 3D Reynolds Average Navier Stokes code SunPans with, I think it was using the generalized link scale turbulence closure from um, Hans Burchard et al. in the, the, the closure in Godem, and you compute the flow. So here you see the, the velocity vector seen from above with the coloring showing you the strength of the horizontal flow. So you imagine you see the kind of ducting of the flow through these features and around these corals, um, presumably separation uh, wakes behind the objects, a little bit closer up, similar kind of flow pattern. If we look at it from the side, here's the flow. We get flow kind of over this obstacle and basically separating pretty clearly off this obstacle, though the separation, since it's a complex three-dimensional object, is obviously pretty complex. Turbulence closure model, eddy viscosity. Um, some of my colleagues who are purists would not like this, but this is what the model computes. And bottom line down here, you see, look at this object, pressure field, high pressure on the, on the front, front stagnation point, incomplete pressure recovery behind, therefore pressure drag. So we can take and compare the model to the observations. Um, here's the one-to-one -one line. They're the, um, the two different models. The red is the log fit, the blue is the drag coefficient. And again, we would say perhaps good enough for government work, the model and the observations are consistent as to what the drag coefficient is. So taking that, Justin can then use the, mod, use the model to say, well, what's the average drag coefficient over that range and how is it related to the topography? And in that he computed the RMS values of the uh, height of the roughness elements divided by their spatial extent. And there's a broadly, it's a consistent, we see that it's primarily pressure drag. And it turns out this fit is consistent with what you get when the obstacles, instead of being these complex coral things are in fact wavy, a wavy surface, a so wave height, wave, wave length. Meaning that if we take a map of the coral and compute this quantity HB on lambda X, the RMS value, we can make a prediction a priori of the drag coefficient. Now, nice thing about that is you can go in and do this um, at places now using uh, what's called structure from motion. And basically someone in this case, Rob Dunbar, my colleague swims back and forth with his camera taking thousands and thousands of pictures. They can be stitched together. And essentially it's a version of uh, stereo photogrammetry that's massively overdetermined, which allows you to determine with quite good accuracy what the actual uh, local height is. And in this case, this is a piece of, of reef uh, in the Chagos Archipelago, which is in the currently British Indian Ocean Territory. At some point in the future, it may be belong again to Mauritius. Um, and this is one millimeter scale topography. So dealing with trying to figure out what to extract out of one millimeter scale topography is tricky. It's like, what's roughness and what's bathymetry? So we ended up using a two by two meter average to define a moving average to define the, the roughness. So it takes out the general shape of this bit of the domain. If we do that, what Mathilde found, my student Mathilde Lindhart, is that the roughness height from three instruments, sort of, there are actually four instruments here present, um, three instruments, um, ADCPs, all in this very small area, agreed with each other pretty well, and within about 20% with what uh, we would get from Justin's work. So that looks pretty good. Now, there's always a, um, 
a, a dark a a, uh, a dark lining to any silver lining to any dark cloud and i'm going to say that the the dark lining to the silver lining is what happens when there are waves present and waves are a pretty common feature of a lot of coral reefs and this is work that we did an embarrassingly long time ago for having not really looked at the data in detail um, where we deployed at this location here in French Polynesia, uh, the Département de Outre-mer. Here we've got this spot here. We deployed an ADP and an ADV in one of the deployments, but otherwise I'm going to show you about five months of deployments where the ADP was sitting here at the same place, and then one day where we had both of these instruments next to each other, and in that one day this instrument was running in a very different mode. It's running in what's called high resolution, those of you that know anything about ADCPs, it's pulse to pulse coherent. Uh, normally the resolution is about 10 centimeters. With this HR mode, the resolution was three centimeters and also velocity data that's much quieter. So here is a region, the waves come, they break on this reef crest. And the flow that we see at this site is a mixture of at times pretty strong mean flows coming over and into this lagoon and broken waves that are pretty boar-like, sawtooth-like. Um, so I took that one, um, one day data and averaged it all together because the flow was reasonably constant as a starting point and fit it to the, the classical canonical rough wall log profile. Uh, that's a fit, I think we'd all agree that's pretty good. Maybe it's not quite as good as Lex Smith's group got um, in Superpipe but it's pretty good. Uh, R squared is 0.99 something. So we have this, this fit and it's all referenced. The drag coefficient here is referenced to one meter height above the bottom. That's a standard one used in oceanographic flows. Now, Jim asked, well, what is, how does it vary? And it turns out it's surprising to me that you don't just get one value of the drag coefficient or equivalently one value of the roughness length Z naught you actually get a distribution, and distribution is over about a factor of two in this case. So an average value of drag coefficient here of 0 0.013, which is about four times the, the canonical value for oceanographic flows over relatively smooth surfaces. It's in the range that we've seen before on coral reefs. Um, if you scale each profile with its own fit, they look quite good. This is uh, plotting Z on, on the time varying Z naught um, against velocity divided by the time varying U star, it looks pretty good. Um, not quite as good if you use the average values, but still plausible. The question is what, what produces this? And look at three of the data sets, the HR and two of the regular data sets, and you can see doing this log fitting, and these are, these are all R squareds are 0.9 or greater, which is pretty good there's pretty substantial variability in the drag coefficient. And so the question is, what's producing that? So I went back and tried to analyze this in terms of the ratio of the mean velocity to the wave velocity. And one plausible model for this that various people like Falk, Federson at Scripps have suggested is, you take, to compute the average drag and thus infer an average drag coefficient, you take, and I'm using here the brackets to mean average, um, you take a, a constant drag coefficient and it operates on whatever the sum of the mean velocity and the wave velocity is. And when you do that, you get a solid line that's this dark solid line. As you can see, the data are pretty scattered, but if I bin average them, and I still don't really know what it is that's producing that variability, these are about 20 minute averages, so they should be um, pretty good. Um, it's the model with the dashed line is this constant variability, sorry, the solid line is the fit. Um, it's consistent. There is actually a model that Bill Grant and Ole Madsen did um, for wave current interactions. That's the dash dot line, and it's also broadly consistent. Now, the interesting thing to me is these all suggest that waves are really not very important uh, in the data set acquired with the high resolution ADP. On the other hand, um, could take the ADV data and going through all of the, doing again, these sort of 20 minute 
averages. I think that was to get a, a fairly large number of samples and compute the cospectra. So I is the integrated cospectra divided by the total stress. So the, the total integral should go to one. That would be the, let's say the stress. So the total stress you would compute naively, sort of U prime W prime without doing anything else is about 0.06 Pascals. Now, common practice in flows like this is to use some kind of wave turbulence separation. And there's a variety of, of methods possible. There's a, a really nice paper by my colleague, Jacques Magnude, who's on this, in the, attending the seminar and his student, Laurent Thez, looking at a much more sophisticated um, decomposition. But this one assumes that everything that's coherent with the waves is waves. So integrated total cospectrum, integrated wave cospectrum, so you can compute the part that's the cospectrum that's associated with the waves, and take them, separate them, or subtract the wave spectrum one from the integrated one, and you get the integrated turbulent spectrum. The solid line is the average, the dashed line, is the canonical flow over a wheat field due to Kaimal et al. And they're pretty close. Now what's puzzling about this is we said here, the waves shouldn't be very important yet. This says in terms of the stresses, the waves at least measured by the ADV are quite important. So they're seeming contradiction. Waves don't appear to influence the overall drag when weak, but do affect the turbulence co-spectra and spectra also. The wave enhancement of drag assuming constant drag coefficient seems to work pretty well. Likewise, Grant Madsen is equally plausible. And lastly, the thing that's really puzzling and what's holding up submitting this paper is that the drag from the ADV is maybe only half the drag inferred from the log fitting. And that may be an issue of stress distribution, which given these are measurements 15 years ago, there's not much I can do about it, or it may be something else. So if I was to summarize the coral reef case, we did this flow in OFU. And from that, basically, we, we think we can do for mean flows, we can take measurements of the bottom roughness, of the bottom topography, detailed bottom topography, and from that, infer drag on corals. And it does actually match what's seen in simpler surfaces. At this point, I don't think we have any way of doing this yet for waves. It's something we're working on thing on. And as you can see, and hopefully in these little examples, it grossly complicates things. Uh, there's a lot of issues to do with how waves and turbulence interact that have only really been looked at um, pretty briefly, like Steve Belcher and his student Miguel Teixeira looked at using rapid distortion theory. There's a lot left to do in this realm. So second case, this one looks pretty good. This one I work out quite well. This is a, a seagrass bed. So we had the first of really fixed hard objects. Second one is the seagrass bed. And this is work we did with Heidi Hirsch and Rob Dunbar. And in fact, so it's mostly motivated by trying to look at the carbon chemistry of the seagrass bed. So this is a seagrass bed in Palau. Flow, tidal flow goes back and forth across the seagrass bed. And we had this array of instruments uh, al aligned along this seagrass bed in cross section. Here are the pressure sensors as before. And here are various velocity measuring instruments, ADPs and an ADV. Now, this does involve to do this kind of project, we also have to do some of the hard work that our biological colleagues do. In this case, it's counting um, and measuring the seagrass. So these are shoot counts. So how many plants coming, sticking up out of the, out of the bottom? How high are they at various points? And what percentage of the bottom is covered by them? And in this region in the center, um, it, it's so dense that to do the counts, the people doing the counting had to do it on scuba, even though it was only about a meter and a half deep, because they otherwise would have been constantly sticking their heads up. So there's essentially in this seagrass bed, the region in the center, this shallow bit is pretty uh, densely covered with seagrass. So the depth varies here, there's about a meter, uh, two meter tidal range, beautifully uh, uh, tidal, velo tidal velocities. Um, we measured the drag, the pressure gradient is the, the kind of funny color blue symbols. And if I take this velocities and do a velocity dependent or time dependent drag coefficient, I can match the pressure gradient to the drag quite precisely. And in that case, I actually did do one subtle thing is the drag is actually an integration along this path where the depths vary. 
but the roughness, the drag coefficient is assumed to be constant. So we do that. The thing that makes this tricky is that the seagrass bends. So at low flow, all those seagrass blades are standing up vertically. At peak tidal flow, as you see in this picture, they're bent over pretty substantially. So how this plays out is that, and I've plotted the drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number, but I'm only doing this Reynolds number to get a non-dimensional number that involves both velocity and depth. I could imagine, one could imagine other similar ones one could make up. This one's fine. Um, here we've got the drag on the ebbs and the floods. There's a little bit of asymmetry, but what you see is the drag coefficient is order one. And I just point out the solid symbol is bind, the, the dots, the George Seurat painting look is the, are colored by the depth. So I've been those data and I fit curves to those. And you can see there's a very pronounced bending effect of the bending is to reduce the drag coefficient by a couple orders of magnitude. So the question is, can we predict this? And the answer is, thank you Heidi Nepp and Matua Luhar. They basically produce a model where you look at the bending of the of the roughness elements. And it also depends on the buoyancy of the roughness elements. So there are two parameters. One that's the Cauchy parameter that depends on the elasticity and the drag on the blade and the length of the blade, the thickness of the blade. And the other is a buoyancy parameter that involves the difference in density between the seagrass bl blades and the flow. Fortunately for me, for us, this is, happens to be, Thalassia, the seagrass was there, happens to be one of the very few for which the parameters E, T, and delta rho are actually known. So I have these parameters, I put them into Heidi's model, and the gray cloud here are the data, the dashed and solid lines are the fits to the data, and again, it's pretty close. So I would say that in this case, it depends strongly on the flow. What we see in the observation, this was called reconfiguration. And it's broadly consistent observationally with previous work, which is actually one pretty incompletely described study. And what we see also is that the model for the drag coefficient works really well. So as an aside, we've, I think this is actually a great place for doing seagrass chemistry. The last one I want to show you, and this is sort of, I, I would have kind of said the bad, the good, and the ugly, as opposed to the good, the bad, and the ugly. This one is the really, really thorny one. And this is work that we have been doing for almost 10 years now, working with Fio McKelly, uh, a marine ecologist colleague of mine in Baja, California. Here's the Vizcaino Peninsula, and here's Isla Natividad off the end of the Vizcaino Peninsula. And um, this is a project actually aimed looking at hypoxia and its effect on abalone fishery. And we've started this project with the notion that it would be important to know currents at the sites. And so we've had maintained two long-term moorings, one at Moro Prieto here on the exposed side and one at Punta Prieta um, inside Vizcaino Bay, this large bay here. Uh, this is kind of an interesting place, by the way, oceanographically in that the Vizcaino Peninsula is sort of the end of the California current that starts up at the southern end of the Gulf of Alaska. And this is basically the southern uh, terminus of that current system. So little terminology on the giant kelp, Macrocystis pyrifera. Um, it consists of these large plants that extend from the bottom, uh, attached with a thing known as the holdfast extends up through the water column, through the things called stipes, these kind of like rope-like things in the water, and then the blades coming off the stipe. So here's a detailed picture of the stipe and the blade. And then these things attached on the blades are actually buoyancy elements. They're called pneumatocysts. They're gas-filled bits of, uh, of, of plant tissue. The result is they make the plants float. And in fact, in um, as Thomas Morley would have said, in height of summer sun, you could have these extensive surface canopies. So the plant grows up through the water column and then continues growing and sitting on the surface. So 
<coughs> imagine flow through these things. So here is a um, what the variability at our field site of estimations of biomass of kelp um, done by Tom Bell um, at UC Santa Barbara, now at Woods Hole. Uh, this is an average for a period of March 2013, to December 2015, which is a period for which we have acoustic Doppler profiler and temperature measurements at both Moro Prieta and Punta Prieta. So what makes this period interesting is that it starts with the growth of the kelp forest. And then here in 2014 is the arrival of what was known as the warm blob. And in addition to the warm blob, there was several hurricanes in this summer. And essentially the kelp biomass goes to zero. So we have a sequence of states where the kelp is fully developed or gone. And if you look at the Punta Prieta uh, currents, which are primarily tidal, and I'll focus on them because the Moro Prieta side is uh, strongly driven by upwelling, so there's a lot of other things going on. Punta Prieta is predominantly tidal, and you can see when the when the kelp gets when the kelp really grows, tidal currents go away. Good. That's not a new finding. It's kind of interesting that this is the first time it's ever been seen where the measurement is at the same place as opposed to different places at the same time. So the question is, can we use this information to infer something about the drag coefficient for kelp? And I messed around with this a bunch. And what I'm gonna show you is what I would think is, is at this point, the best I can come up with. And the idea was to, to take a simple model of the momentum balance in this water column and say, okay, we have pressure grade, we have the acceleration, we have this bottom drag, and we have a pressure gradient. So if we knew the pressure gradient, which we've done in previous times, we could solve this directly, right? We could integrate and find the velocity. Um, what about if we assumed that it's a progressive tidal wave? And the idea being that in this large, let me go back here, in this large bay, the tidal currents, the pressure gradients in here are not really determined at all by what's going on right near the shore. It's kind of like a boundary layer um, assumption, except now the boundary layer is horizontal. In which case, one can show that the slope is one on the square root of GH times the eta dt. And in the absence of drag, it can be shown that the RMS velocity you produce is this wave speed, square root of GH, divided by H times the RMS wave height. So let me call that the inviscid uh, RMS wave velocity. And so the ratio of RMS velocity you get to the RMS inviscid RMS velocity is a measure of how important the drag is. So we have kind of this non-dimensional ratio of what you could get if there was no drag relative to what you actually get. So this is a good reason, good chance to choose, do some non-dimensionalization. So if we non-dimensionalize the velocity we might compute by this inviscid value using, assuming a, a single, uh, a single tide with uh, known uh, propagation characteristics. We normalize time by the tidal frequency, and we normalize eta by the um, surface tide height. Momentum equation then becomes this simple uh, di uh, differential equation, ordinary differential equation with one parameter p that's kind of a, a drag parameter. And I, Embarrassed that I couldn't think of a better parameter. Maybe I should figure out somebody whose name can get attached to it. But the drag coefficient times the wave speed times the height divided by omega h squared is a non-dimensional number. So the bigger CD is, the more important drag is. So if we calculate this, we get this lovely looking curve that shows us how R, this ratio of sort of how much, what the velocity is relative to the inviscid velocity, depends on P. Now, the tricky thing with this is, turns out you can adjust this to allow for um, multiple constituents in terms of RMS tidal height. Um, there's a, a little bit of fudging to do it, but it's straightforward. And so the idea is, suppose we know this ratio that allows us to figure out what value of P produced it. Knowing P and knowing the tidal characteristics and the phase velocity, we can infer the drag coefficient. So we do this, 
And I can take then drag coefficient and plot it as a function of kelp biomass. And this is uh, what's called robust fitting. Robust fitting has a systematic way of dealing with outliers. And what we see is that the drag uh, starts off down at the kind of canonical values and pretty quickly gets up to an asymptotic value of about 0 0.04. Um, I've shown here the 95% confidence interval. So I think this is pretty reasonable. Um, one of the things that's interesting is this is much lower than people like uh, the very smart George Jackson um, have assumed where they had measured changes in flow in kelp forests a long time ago. And it suggests in fact that given that there's not much effect after a relatively low value of kelp biomass suggests what's called sheltering. The fact that you've got the roughness elements so close together that the roughness elements are not actually seeing the average, seeing the, um, many of them are not seeing the mean flow, but rather seeing they're sitting in the wake of another, another plant. This is great. On the other hand, I put this in the, it ain't necessarily so case in that we have measurements from this kelp forest, um, the Monterey Aquarium is about where the words Maccabee kelp sits. It's a kelp forest in Southern Monterey Bay that runs parallel to shore. There was a measurement outside and a measurement inside. Measurement outside shows the kind of messy, mostly semidurnal internal tides in Monterey Bay. And inside the flow there is nearly zero. And one of the things this points out, and this is really difficult for kelp, is the measurements you make to have flow inside the kelp, they really need to be inside the kelp. And just to give you an idea of the, the complicated nature of this, and I should have pointed out that both of the Mora Prieta and the Punta Prieta measurements were just on the edge of the kelp forest. So not quite actually in the kelp forest. Um, we did some measurements at Hopkins Marine Station here, actually in this bit of the kelp forest. Um, and we had three ADCPs within 30 meters of each other. And here is their variability uh, velocity inside relative to the velocity outside. So the velocity outside was measured over here, Cabrillo Point. So it's one of the big challenges. How do we describe the velocity fields accurately in a kelp forest? I think it's even worse than what happens in a, in a coral reef. Now, it also notes that what causes the drag on the kelp. So here we've got, we've got flow. Flow goes past these, these stipes and fronds. There's a surface canopy. All of these things contribute drag. Now, the nasty aspect of this is this is all stuff that's moving. These places are all generally places where there are surface waves. And where there are surface waves, we have moving and accelerating flows. The drag elements here themselves are moving and accelerating. So you have about the com most complicated uh, flow configuration that you could imagine. So we know that in solid objects, waves can really increase the drag. And I showed you that for the kelp forest case, but the kelp moves with the waves. So the question is, how does this affect the drag? Um, Joanna Rossman looked at this in her thesis and did some nice lab experiments with uh, plastic models of kelp and sort of suggest that there's a slight enhancement and essentially it can be uh, examined by considering the bottom is fixed. So you get the kind of resistance associated with a fixed object and the surface moves with the wave. So there's no effect um, on near the surface. But it actually kind of belies a, a, a more, uh, another question. Um, the question is what bit of kelp where influences currents at a particular place? So if we were sitting, here's a, an image taken from a drone by an uh, undergraduate at Stanford, J.P. Spaventa. Um, if you were sitting at this point, which kelp plants, you know, how far away from this, this spot do the kelp plants matter? So that's the that's question. And again, we get to this question of what's the residence time? what mechanism of flow, what flow, what flow directions and mechanisms are actually important to exchange? Open question. I should point out this picture actually, um, these little white dots in here are actually otters. And that was the purpose of JP's um, drone surveys was actually to use drones to um, do surveys of otters around the Monterey Peninsula. <laughs> 
So we are approaching this, and in the spring, we're going to be doing a, a frighteningly large um, field experiment. Actually, since I made this slide, we're actually going to be working up in this area. Um, this is Point Loma. This is uh, near San Diego. This is San Diego Bay just coming out here. Scripps is kind of about this far up above. Um, this is the long, largest kelp forest um, in North America. And the nice thing is it's basically this nice rectilinear um, forest. It has, it's there all, you know, pretty much all the time. Um, it's close to scripts. So what we're going to do is put out lots of current meters, uh, lots of pressure sensors, make lots of temperature measurements. And the unique thing I think we'll add to this is we're going to measure the drag directly as we did with the coral reefs and seagrass beds. And we're also going to put little accelerometer tilt sensors on the kelp plants so we measure their motions directly. Um, still talking about drone imagery, but um, given the role of the US Navy in this area, it's hard to get permission to, to fly drones. So to conclude, um, it looks like moderate high relief coral reefs look like man-made surfaces. And knowing the small scale topography, we can estimate the drag coefficient. Seagrass beds behave in a more complex way due to deflection of the roughness elements. And we could probably use a little more work on this one, particularly including mean currents and waves and doing observations, not various kind of plastic models in the lab. Kelp forests to me are the most complex. The drag comes from fixed things that are things that are fixed, things that are streaming, things that are floating. And so whatever drag you have must depend on kelp state. These are also places of complex bottom topography. Um, Hopkins Marine Station, uh, the kelp forest there where we first started doing measurements is pretty much about as most complicated place you can imagine. It's a headland with roughness um, elements on the bottom, the size of railroad cars, as well as the kelp. Um, so it's really an open problem as to how we might take things like stipe counts, measurements of the kelp state, and compute the drag coefficient that's appropriate to use, say, in a coastal circulation model. And in fact, one of the challenges is how do we actually measure that other than putting divers in the water and having them do very long dives, counting plants, measuring lengths, doing, doing all of that. The last question I'll ask, and this is one that uh, my colleague Theo um, raises, although Andy Woods actually raised it a couple of years ago when I was at Cambridge and gave a seminar on coral reef stuff. Um, is there feedback between flow and ecological processes that's important to the long-term evolution of coastal ecosystems? So this is a case I think where, you know, the more that we can provide, we that do fluid mechanics to provide information about the mechanics and mechanisms, the more my colleagues like Theo and chemists like Rob Dunbar can sort of try to untangle this larger question of ecology and flow. So that's where I'll finish and thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, so the first question, so we had uh, Yazdan asking, in summary, how much does buoyancy add to the drag? So to the drag of the kelp forest? Yes, kelp forest. Kelp forest, okay. So the buoyancy uh, is important to the drag because it keeps the plants upright. So if you look, if you go out there, even under strong currents and relatively strong waves, uh, the kelp plants are still upright. They're still vertical in the water column, unlike the seagrass ones that in strong currents just kind of flop over. So I think buoyancy is sort of what enables the, or implies that the kelp remains like a strong drag element. Does that answer your question? Oh, well, to some extent, uh, but you know, the percentage was very important. How much you think? I was gonna sign a percentage. Yes. I would say um, if they weren't buoyant, 90%, 95%, it would, the drag would be all associated with these plants lying on the bottom, which would be pretty low. It'd be probably indistinguishable from the otherwise, the roughness um, associated with uh, the other stuff on the bottom. Hi, a very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, actually, maybe this question is not like, it's not easy to do this measurement on the field, but maybe in the lab. So my question is, um, there, there, are, there are these flows over the organisms on the ocean floor. And I look at it as a similar thing to 
flow over particles that are stuck on sub substrates, which is relevant to you know semiconductors and other uh, technologies. So if if the flow can cause a drag force on these organisms, at some point I could imagine them detaching from the ocean floor. Is there any measurements of the detachment force or stress, uh, which which of course is curious, is interesting and something that could be translated for other uh, areas as well. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So, so for for corals, there's been a fair amount of work um, looking at what you know under what conditions do corals essentially break. So they, um, the a lot of the branching corals in particular look like little trees that they've got kind of a stalk that goes down to attaches to the bottom, and um, it still seems like an open question: Do they break because the stalk as a whole detaches? Or do they break because you kind of break that rod? That's the stalk itself. Mm. Um, I'm not sure anyone has observed this. Um, it would be an interesting thing to, to try in, in the lab, although it would mean being able to collect living corals because the, mm. the state of the attachment is very much dependent on it being alive. And in the real cases, nobody's very keen to go out on the coral reefs in the middle of uh, you know, hurricanes and cyclones. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. So maybe so, laboratory based CB we work. Yeah, with it would be interesting to figure out. And for kelp, you know, mm -hmm. this the same kind of thing happens. It in storms, there's a variety of things is that the, they eventually the hold fast break free. And one of the things that seems to happen in the storms then is you get like the a kelp, maybe you get some fronds break off one plant. And they wrap around another one and, and increase the drag on that one. At some point, <coughs> it's enough for the holdfast to come off. Mm. And once that happens, then you get more plants. And so it's kind of like a catastrophic failure mm -hmm. that you can lose the whole kelp forest or a lot of it by this sort of accumulation. But it mm -hmm. is a, that would be pretty feasible to go in, you know, figure out how to do like a force transducer setup, put a frame around one of these stipes. And essentially figure out how hard you have to pull to get it off. Yeah, yeah. That would be, a re I don't think anyone, I should look, the person who's most likely to have done something along these lines is my colleague at Hopkins, uh, Mark Denny, who's done all kinds of wild things. Like, I didn't mention it, but the, the, kelp, the kelp flow acceleration stuff, he's looked at somewhat with his, uh, with also with Brian Gaylord. And it turns out that the bending of and behavior of the kelp includes the fact that the rheology of the kelp plants is pretty complicated. They're not just elastic. They, they're kind of viscoelastic plastic. I'm not sure which, where they are, but they don't have the simple stress strain relation. Hmm. So their bending is, is more complex, but it certainly seems like it'd be pretty doable to figure out how hard you have to yank to get one off the bottom or maybe yes. do 10 of them. Um, my student, Margaret Daly, who's, gonna, who's doing, the drag doing the drag and displacement measurements, is interested in doing the same thing. Take a plant, um, after you've done it for say two weeks, flipping back and forth in the waves, cut all the blades off and see how much it moves around. Um, again, these kind of modifications are things that are, can be challenging from a permitting standpoint. I hear Jeanette laughing. Um, uh, sort of damaging kelp forests is not something we generally seek to do, but it would be a good thing to know because we do see, you know, storm events on the West Coast that can take out uh, a lot of kelp plants. Kelp state can be hugely variable. It's also coupled to the fact that the plants are growing, you know, in the in the spring and early summer, and then late summer, um, fall, they're senescing. They're kind of dying back, just like you know, like the plants in my yard might do. Mm. <clears throat> and so they're also in kind of a weakened state, so they're more easily mm. damaged. Okay, I mean, uh, I just, I'm not, all, I'm not at all from this field, so all this is very exciting and new to hear, so I hope, uh, I mean, there is some connection that I could use for my own work. Yeah, Thank so uh, my, my colleague Jeff Kosef mentioned, reminded me that along with uh, Matt Reidenbach and Mimi Cole, they actually measured um, some detachment stress for larvae on corals. The idea mm. that the, the larvae are stuck to the bottom and you have flow over them and some kind of probability distribution function of the stresses, mm. that can result in the larvae being pulled off. Mm. And otherwise they might be trying to well, settle. I, 
But that's mm. a, that's a, that one. I think there's been a lot kind of in that domain, mm -hmm. so thinking about the interaction of things like larvae that want to stick to surfaces that get pulled off. Yeah, that, that's approximately true, even for microparticles exposed to like shock waves or basically cleaning flows. Steve, thank you for your talk. I, relative to now, your last question or answer. D did you do any measurements at the Kolmogorov scale, at the tiny scale? For these cases, no. Is it possible? Um, I, well, I think so. We actually have a student, um, Jen Yin, that Nicolette <laughs> and I are advising, um, who's trying to do, not, <laughs> that'll be tricky there, yeah. Jen is, is built a, a, a four camera, 3D particle tracking system that we're looking for sites to deploy. And the idea is to go from kind of the, the 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter scale down to Kolmogorov. Wonderful. We built it with the idea of doing stratified turbulence is partially based on thinking about the, the fact that when we do stratified turbulence, we, we throw um, you know, instruments through the water column that measure small scale shear, but we don't really see structure. Huh? So we're trying to think about, I think you know, Hopkins for us actually is an easy place to work with this instrument. Because you know you basically more anchor a boat and have you know computer cables connected down to the, the PTV system, so it'd be interesting. I was one of the ones I wanted to kind of do is maybe like the wake behind the kelp, down near yes. the bottom. You know, there's a lot of interesting. This picture doesn't show up, but a lot of the interesting stuff happening with organisms is happening kind of around the bottoms and who's crawling around on the holdfast or on the surface. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So those and, and also. There's actually, yeah, there's some, I have some pictures of um, rockfish larvae, small, small, I know, I guess I'm slightly larger than larval rockfish, all hanging out between the stipes. Cool. So, yeah, so it's, I think it would be lots of opportunity. Again, doing it on a coral reef would be really interesting, but also challenging by the fact that um, it's, it's, uh, relatively particle free. So she's mm -hmm. trying to figure out now, this is the proposal we're writing for NSF um, for February. It's like, where is the sweet spot for enough particles for it to work, but not so many particles that it's impossible for us to work with it. Mm. And in, in fact, also a lot of particles tend to also um, cut the light. So you, it makes it hard to do it. Cause we now, for the PTV system, you have to illuminate a three dimensional volume. So she's talking about us buying kind of a 10x increase in LEDs. Nice thing is that there are lots of dive light kind of stuff for this purpose off the shelf. Wonderful, wonderful. Good. So is it natural particles or you're seeing- Natural them? particles, but it's certainly within the realm to think about, you know, trying to seed with something that's not too disgusting. <laughs> okay, thank so you so George, much, Steve. George Matsumoto at Embarro pointed on me. Um, we actually had a cable system um, at Hopkins that Brock was one of the principal movers on. And it, <laughs> after a while finally died, but Embari is putting, um, putting it back in. And it, so it's a thing we could actually try to connect up the PTV system to the cable. Very good, thank you so much. So I see that Paul asked the question, are you able to yeah. relate the supply of nutrients to a coral reef to the drag? Is this a mechanism for feedback between flow and coral morphology? So yes. The supply of nutrients that goes to the, to the symbionts in the coral and thus kind of indirectly to the coral, the symbionts are the algae that live in the coral, that's been shown to be mass transfer limited. So that's something the late Marlon Atkinson showed pretty convincingly. And in fact, the scaling for that part follows exactly the, the scaling seen for, for mass transfer, particularly for high Schmidt number. Um, Marlon was able to show that the results that they did measurements in Kaneohe Bay and also in a, in a kind of a funky flume were completely consistent with measurements done at Caltech in like the 50s on, on mass transfer. So yeah, it's, this is absolutely, and the connection to morphology is something that Jan Kondorp in Holland has explored, although he has used kind of a more heuristic, I would say heuristic model it's, we tried to do something like this where we used a, uh, a student, Sandy Chang, built a pretty detailed 3D LES model of a single coral colony 
And there we found that the mass transfer is incredibly variable around the surface of the coral, as you might expect. And so um, that's on one side. And then biology always seems to find a way of, of trumping these things, so to speak. We don't like to use that word anymore. Um, but they apparently, corals have the ability to move, it's called translocation, and move the nutrients around inside their tissue. So the coral sitting there, the coral colony, actually kind of has a continuous strata of, of tissue that it can move things around inside itself. So some parts see more light, so have more photosynthesis, so they can shift photosynthetic products around. But I, I think it would be a great grand challenge project to make a first principles model of a coral that includes the physics, the flow around it, and the variability, but also in equivalent detail, you could almost imagine, you know, taking the, the coral, living corals off and creating kind of a two-dimensional sort of, this is a, this is a good topology problem, map the one, you know, a two-dimensional plane of corals onto the three-dimensional surface and model that because it has, you know, variations with depth inside the coral strata, the sort of the dynamics of the individual polyps. At a small scale, one of the things that we still really don't know is, is the drag on a coral skeleton at small scales the same as on living corals? And the reason they might not be is that the coral skeleton, the polyps themselves are flexible. And the polyps have these little, the little tentacles sticking out because they're essentially anemones. And those are flexible. And then the whole thing can be covered with mucus. So you've got this non-Newtonian fluid on the surface. So that was something uh, on my whiteboard from pre-pandemic days was a note to try to talk to uh, Panaki Chakaburti at uh, OIST and my colleague, uh, Jerry Fuller, to see if we can do some sort of simple experiments on flow over a surface that has a non-Newtonian coating and how it might connect to corals. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Very nice talk, by the way. Thanks, Paul. Nice, nice to see you guys, by the way, last December. Yep, good to have you. So we have a question from Matthew Wells. Uh, what were some of the implications of different turbulence levels for biology or dissolved oxygen in these systems? Um, so coral reef, it's, these are shallow, pretty well stirred. So um, there are some variation, but certainly never very far below uh, saturation. The seagrass bed, um, is pretty wild in that the turbulence is actually um, presumably what controls uh, air-sea gas exchange. So the turbulence produced by the flow over the seagrass bed. And the thing is the seagrass bed um, on some of the sunny days gets going um, like gangbusters at producing oxygen. Um, so we get can get highly supersaturated um, cases. I mean, in fact, I have some movies of this kelp of the seagrass bed in Palau showing it bubbling. So one of the challenges this has presented for us is Heidi did some really nice measurements doing control volumes to examine oxygen dynamics to look at production and respiration in the seagrass bed. And we're not sure what to make out of the 200, the fact that the optodes, the oxygen sensors measured 200% saturation. It's not clear that they're actually calibrated to those values. And um, the other thing is in terms of measuring production rate, given that we've got bubbling, we didn't capture that at all. The bubbles come through. So <coughs> turbulence is important for that. Finally, in the case of the kelp forest, presumably it's very important. And it's made complicated by the fact, and, and I sort of danced over this, that the kelp forest flows are sitting in upwelling systems and are usually stratified. So how the stratification interacts and turbulence in the presence of the kelp, the flows are slower. So what we've seen is the kelp forests tend to be more stratified and combining velocity measurements with stratification tend to be generally existing at potentially somewhat higher Richardson number. So the flow inside the kelp forest is probably more stable than outside. Although the complicating factor is that if it's stratifying diurnally due to surface heat fluxes, a lot of that action takes place up in the canopy. So in fact, I think a really interesting model for a kelp forest conceptual model almost might like be like an 
ocean mix layer kind of thing where you've got this surface canopy layer that gets hot because it absorbs all the light. It's also where all of the biogeochemical action is taking place and then things underneath. At Hopkins, the big thing that's affecting stratification also at, at Moro Prieta and La Prieta, Punta Prieta is internal tides. So these are also sites of internal tides. So you have this other driver of stratification. Um, so a lot of the cases where we see particularly low oxygen are also associated with the internal tides. And essentially what's happening is you're bringing up low dissolved oxygen water from depth. It's sort of almost like a tide coming in. This is actually the, the, the model that Paul Leary here with his divining rod was trying to get at an internal tide pool. Cold hypoxic water comes up in these internal tides. It washes into the near shore and kind of maybe hangs around in, in depressions. If it's stratified, that doesn't mix. And as a result, you can have hypoxic conditions persist near the bottom where things like abalone that people like to eat are and they can die. With the frequency of extreme events appearing to increase as a result of climate change, what one might predict that the kelp forests may be stripped more frequently and over large areas. Is this likely to mean a reduced coverage or simply that the individual specimens will be unable to recover or to grow as large? And will it destabilize the entire system? So if you Excellent have a question. Let's, crystal, let's, crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, that's because let's throw in also warmer oceans um, potentially in, in upwelling systems like Monterey Bay or actually also really actually great ones around New Zealand, um, Tasmania, same and South Africa, shut down upwelling, shut down nutrient flux, plants don't grow. So I, I think that there, there's no possibility on the horizon of things that are good for kelp. Um, so I think that the concern is that every, every one of these drivers are things that will reduce kelp forests. I think it's uh, storms are probably likely to be more destructive of the kelp forest as a whole. Whether or not, you know, sort of increasing heat waves, that was one of the things that Tom Bell and colleagues at Santa Barbara, Dave Siegel, Dan Reed, others, um, that's another thing is that if the warm blob of 2014, 2015 was just death to kelp forests on the west coast of North America. So, um, so I think that's like the more the, the, the total elimination, you know, sort of total destruction, as opposed to affecting individual plants, uh, destabilize. Uh, one of the, the big drivers right now of sort of ecological destabilization of kelp forests, at least on the west coast, of North America and particularly California is urchins. And uh, urchins are um, amazingly good at killing off kelp. And in fact, um, that's there are actually people, there are groups now around Monterey that go out and smash up urchins with hammers. They're dive groups that try to keep them, remove them. And the urchins they think increase because of they die off of their chief predator, which is starfish, and the starfish, starfish wasting disease. And there's a possibility that that's a climate temperature change induced thing. So there's all kinds of possible mechanisms. Uh, I don't see any of them as being good in terms of future of kelp forests. Throwing in um, ocean acidification, maybe not so much. That's kind of the only one because kelp so strongly modify their own environment. So, Stuart, does that answer your question? Y yes, thanks, but on a down note. Yeah, on a down note, yeah. Yeah, let's think about happy things like Omicron falling off. And, and us not getting seriously ill as a result of it. Yeah, not getting seriously result. And all the money you save by not having Christmas parties. <laughs>